Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Power. Power is a concept and a word and really a thing that creates all kinds of different responses. In America, we're taught to be mostly suspicious of power, right? Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. One shouldn't have too much power because what ends up happening? In our fallen world, that power at the very least gets misapplied and often abused. But if you think about it, we are also the beneficiaries of power as well. There's power in the engine of your car, and that's how you get from one place to the other. There's power in your parents. Your dad's strength has probably saved you more than once or twice. The strength of your mother in the midst of life. The power of, I'm always amazed by the power of construction equipment. Right, you see the, the arm move and you think it's about to hit something solid and it just blasts right through it. That's power. We wouldn't be able to create and build all the things that we have today without that power. So power is not all bad. Power is just a thing, a concept. But in our sinful and fallen world, often power is abused. And instead of using it to serve, it's used to oppress, to attack, to kill, to defeat. Well, in our gospel reading today, Jesus is displaying his power. And it is a sight to behold. And Jesus, his power prompts the same sort of varied response that it prompts in us, right? Imagine the awe you feel when you see some of nature's power, but it also fills you with fear. I come from Tornado Valley in southwestern Missouri, and many, of pe many people in the country only know one town in that area that's not bigger than, um, than your average town, and that's Joplin. And they know Joplin because a giant tornado tore through that town and wreaked havoc. The power of nature. And don't get me wrong, there's people that chase those tornadoes around because they are a sight to behold. But as soon as it starts heading your way, you got to get out of there because you know what they can do. Well, Jesus' power is on display in our gospel reading. And we're going to take a look at that to understand how as Christians we should understand power. So first, let's get into the context of the story. So Jesus, the story in the gospel reading is he's casting out a demon from what is sometimes called the Gerasene demoniac. But how did we get there? It says at the beginning of our text they were getting out of a boat. What were they doing right before that? Well, this chapter starts with the parable of the sower, right? So we have the theme of growth and seeds and and growing going on. And then they get in a boat, and they're going to cross the Sea of Galilee, and I bet you know this story. Jesus falls asleep, and the wind and the waves pick up, the power of nature on full display, and what is the reaction of the disciples? They're competent sailors, fishermen, they've been doing this for years and years, they're afraid. And they wonder why Jesus isn't. How can you be sleeping, Lord? Don't you care that we're going to die? And Jesus' response is, oh, you have little faith. And then he displays exactly why he wasn't afraid. He stands up and he tells all that stuff to cut it out. And what happens? He disappears. Ceases. And the response of the disciples are like, I thought I knew who this guy was, but who am I in a boat with right now? That even the wind and the waves obey him. And so now, right after that, they step off of the boat, and the first guy they meet is quite a character. 
Let's see how the text describes him. When Jesus had stepped out on land, they met a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, so he's naked, and he had not lived in a house but among tombs. So a crazed, demon-possessed, naked man who lives in tombs meets them when they step out of the boat. What would your reaction be? That's the kind of person I think I would probably try to avoid, wouldn't you? But just to, for a moment, put yourself in the, in the shoes of the disciples as they're witnessing what is about to happen to this man. Can you imagine the emotional roller coaster they're on? I mean, they're probably like, okay, the parable stuff and the teaching, we're all about that, we get that, you're a rabbi, you're a teacher. But as soon as Jesus starts showing his power, and that he's more than just a teacher with something to say, there's fear, there's awe, there's curiosity. And now we've got a crazy naked man. What's Jesus going to do? Well, and if that isn't wowing enough for you, after this account in the Gospels, one of the very next things is the healing of the woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and all she had to do was touch Jesus. And he says, I perceive that power has gone out from me. And he does that while he's on the way to raise a little girl from the dead. Jesus has some serious power. It's almost as if nothing in the world is outside of his control. That's what his disciples are finding out. Whether it's a storm or a demon-possessed, crazed, naked man a dead daughter or a woman with a terminal and perennial chronicle illness, they all are under the authority and power of Jesus. Ah, it's incredible. Jesus has the power. All right, so we get to our text, our account for this morning. And there's a lot going on here visually that, you know, you kind of read over, but you think about, and you're like, why are there a bunch of pigs? Why is it going into all this detail about where the guy lives and he's, you know, in chains and going out in the desert and all that stuff? So let's break some of that down a bit. So he's from the city, but now he lives outside of the city. And you got a little cue in the Old Testament reading today that these are all signifiers that this man is like the most unclean of the unclean. So for the Jewish mind, this guy's got an unclean spirit. He lives with the dead, super unclean. He's not allowed in polite society. And then when the demon seizes control of him, he drives him into the desert, which was a place thought to be haunted by unclean spirits. So here you have a picture of the worst of the worst, the biggest mess the fallen world has to offer. Is Jesus going to have enough power to deal with the mess that this man is, with all of the things clinging to him, the unclean of the unclean. And to drive that point home, you have a herd of pigs that would never be around in the, in the, among the people of Israel. Right? Pigs are unclean, right? In our Old Testament reading, it says that, that these people who aren't listening to me, they're eating the flesh of pigs. So everything around the disciples, as soon as they get off the boat, is like the worst thing they can think of. This dude's a Gentile. He's got unclean spirits. He's living among the dead. He's driven out into the wilderness often. And now, on top of it all, there's a bunch of pigs over here. This would be like if you and I went into like a really smelly room with a bunch of people that are naked, that have no money, that haven't showered in weeks that are doing drugs, all the, all, all the worst things you can think of. That's what it's like for the disciples. That's the picture that's being drawn here. And the question in their minds is probably after just seeing Jesus command the wind and the waves, the disciples are probably thinking, what is going to happen with this situation? Jesus goes to work. 
And notice, often we get this idea that good and evil are this evenly matched force. What's the first thing that demons do? They come and kneel at the feet of Jesus and beg him not to torment them. They know who he is. What do you have to do with us, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? They know the gig is up. They don't even ask for mercy. They just really ask, don't send us straight to hell. Don't send us into the abyss. So they negotiate the pigs. Right? And so Jesus is wiping every unclean thing out. He's got the power to do it. Now, of course, when you put that kind of power display on, you're going to have various reactions. And interestingly, the text doesn't really tell us what the disciples react to in this situation. They're there. They're seeing all this happen. I'm sure they had their reactions. But the reactions we hear are from the man possessed by demons and then the herdsmen who then go and tell people in the city, like, you're not going to believe what just happened. You've got to come see this. And how do they respond? Well, the guy who was possessed by demons is grateful. He loves it that Jesus has the power. And we'll get to why his reaction is so different from the herdsmen and all the people who heard about it. They are afraid. They're afraid. The text says they're seized with great fear. So we get this various response. And we know this. How often do we have different responses to the power of Jesus in our lives? Are you really, did you really do that for me? Are you sending me to do this? I'm not worthy. Right? Like Peter, I'm a, I'm, I'm a man of unclean lips. And Isaiah, Peter in the boat, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Right? The power of God evokes fear in us because we know we're not clean. And the only way we can conceive of the kind of power to deal with that is from our broken and fallen nature. And you know that people respond differently to the power of God when you tell them about it. Some people scoff at it. Have you ever had somebody scoff at God and His power? Maybe you didn't even have to tell them about it, but they heard about it and they're like, that person's crazy. How could a loving God allow this to happen? He doesn't do that. How can a just and all-powerful God have this world the way it is? He seems at least negligent, if not malicious. Perhaps you felt that way in your own life. But the crazed, naked, demon-possessed man, when the people come out to see what everything is happening, where's he at? The text says he's at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind, perhaps for the first time in his whole life healed because Jesus has the power. And notice that the thing that it says specifically that scares the people of the city when they come out is the herdsmen describe the process of Jesus healing the demon-possessed man. Because all of these people, they know the guy. They've been dealing with him for a long time. And they do not recognize what he has become. Now, how true is that for you? Imagine. Or maybe you don't have to imagine. Maybe you are the first person to become a Christian in your family. And you get some of those reactions, don't you? Oh, man. This isn't, this isn't who I remember you to be. What's going on? So they're seized with great fear about this change, this power of Jesus. So what's the difference? Why are they afraid, and why is this guy sitting at the feet of Jesus? 
And not only that, after all this is going on, they tell Jesus, we want you to leave because they're afraid of him. And Jesus gets ready to go, and the, the demon-possessed man who has now been healed begs Jesus. It doesn't even say to, like, be his disciple or to follow him. It says he begs to just be with Jesus. He just wants to go where he's going to go. The difference is this. One of those groups of people experience the power of Jesus directly. You see, we can't conceive of the sort of power that Jesus has and the way that he chooses to use it. Jesus has all the power in the universe. He could have just wiped everything out. But instead, he chooses to use all that power to wash this man clean, to heal him of all that ails him. He didn't invite Jesus to come across the lake. He didn't ask. Jesus didn't ask for permission to do what he did to this man. Nor did the person request it. He simply did it. Because our God is merciful and powerful and he uses all of that power for mercy. But the people who merely witness it don't really understand. They're just afraid. Because they didn't experience it themselves. Have you ever tried to explain faith to somebody who doesn't have it? If you never have, give it a try sometime. You'll soon find out why there's this different reaction. Our God who's all-powerful, good. The person of faith says, good, because I know because of my faith through the Holy Spirit what he's using that power for. He's using it to heal me, to redeem me, to cleanse me of all that makes me unclean. But the person without faith doesn't understand that. So you may say to them, well, I believe that God washed away my sin by dying on the cross. And they'll say, well, how do you know? How do you know that's true? And you can use all the fancy words you want, but the basic answer is, because I believe him. Did Jesus really cast out a demon from this crazed, naked man and heal him? I believe he did. How do you know? I believe him. How do you believe him? Well, I, you know, I, I read a lot of books, and I came to this conclusion rationally that what Jesus says and does makes sense, and that's why I believe. Nope. Jesus has the power, not me, right? I believe him because he gave me faith to do so. That's really what we believe. You didn't invite Jesus in. You didn't ask him to clean you up, just like this man possessed by a demon. But that's what Jesus does. That's why he's here. That's how he uses all the power that he's been given. And you know this to be true. That is why you're here this morning. Did you believe him? You believe that he has power and you believe that he's using that power for you. For your good. To make you whole again. To wash you clean of all the things that our fallen world and sin have done to you. And so it's a joyous day to come to the house of the Lord, where our Lord meets us and cleanses us from all our sin. That's why we can say, I, a poor, miserable sinner, and we're not all clinically depressed. Because we know what our God is going to say in response to our confession of sin. He's going to use the power that He has to declare us forgiven. Only certain people have that power. We know that. That's the way it works in our courts of law as well. If I'm a random dude that came to watch a court trial and I stand up and say, you're acquitted, does it do any good? No. If the judge says it, then it's done. The judge of this world is Jesus, and he has come to tell you, you're acquitted, you're forgiven. You're no longer unclean, but clean. You're no longer dead, but alive. You are mine. He didn't ask for your permission. He sent somebody 
who told you about him, and then his power was directly applied to you via the Holy Spirit, and now you're sitting at the feet of Jesus, clean, clothed, and in your right mind. In baptism, Jesus washes away your sins. He washed away your uncleanness. In the Lord's Supper, he offers you the power of his redeeming body and blood from the great sin sacrifice once and for all. And the words in those things are for you. When you come up to receive the body and blood of Jesus, those are the words that are spoken to you. That all this power is for you. So Jesus has power, and it is a very good thing. The last part of the text I want to look at before I conclude is Jesus' response to the demon-possessed man's desire to be with him. It's somewhat surprising. You would think Jesus would be like, yeah, come on. But he turns him away. After he did all this amazing stuff, he cleans him up, heals him, and he says, wherever you're going, I want to go. I, want, I just want to be with you. We don't know why. He could have been afraid that he's going to revert back to the state he was in, that those things will come back and get him. And he knows, that guy's got the power. I'm going to go where he goes, because then if something happens, he can fix me again. Or maybe he just wanted to be around the person who loved him and healed him, who didn't drive him out of the city. But regardless of the reason, Jesus turns him away and he says, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And then that's exactly what he does. He says that he goes into the city proclaiming what Jesus had done for him. In the Lutheran Confession of the Scriptures, we believe in a doctrine of vocation. We believe that the Scriptures talk about that, and this is an example of that teaching. Jesus didn't turn this man away because he didn't want him with him. He turned him away because he had something else in mind for him to do. He wasn't given to be one of the disciples that Jesus was training by traveling around with him. But he sends him just the same. Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. He might as well be speaking to you and me. For this is the charge that he gives each of us. Return to your home. Now, it doesn't mean your literal house, right? Although that's part of it, right? Return to your home. Return to your family, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, your community, your city. And tell people what God has done for you. That's the work of the church. That's what this season of the church is about. That's how we grow. We're sent. And this is key. This man isn't sent to some far off country to plant a church. That's obvious. We recognize that as the work of God. We don't often recognize the normal everyday stuff as the work of God, but that's exactly what it is. Talk to your family about Jesus. Tell your kids what Jesus has done in your life. Tell your neighbors. Tell your coworkers. God placed you in those relationships for a reason. He sent you there just as he sent this man. Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. Dave Dilley and I were just at the Eastern District Convention the last couple of days. We did some voting on these little fancy machines. It was quite nice, and I was horrified at thinking about what it would have been like without those, writing out on a piece of paper and then counting every single time. Yuck. So I'm glad to be born the time I was born, I guess. Um, but they also had some breakout sessions with some presentations, and one of them actually had a lot of overlap with this text, in this part in particular. It's through Lutheran Hour Ministries, they have a spiritual conversations format. And it simplifies the work of evangelism in just the same way. Go home and tell people about what God has done for you. See, we get caught up in thinking that evangelism is somewhere out there, 
and that the main work of evangelism is telling people what we think they should do because of who Jesus is. But they're the herdsmen and the people of the city. Jesus terrifies them when he's applied to their life because they don't have faith. He doesn't say, return to your home and tell everybody what you think they should do because of what I did for you. What does he say? Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And in this format, the spiritual conversations format, your goal in meeting with somebody is to get to know them and to pay attention for an opportunity they give you to do exactly this. Not to tell them what you think they should do, but to tell them what God has done for you. How Jesus has taken all of your uncleanness away. And made you his child. And how that provides meaning for your life, not just here, but in, in eternity. How it brings you a peace that they have no hope of understanding apart from Jesus. Because you know everything's going to be alright, even when things in this life are not. People are looking for that, and Jesus knows it. That's why he sends this man home. So, dear friends in Christ, Jesus is teaching us in this text that once he has displayed his power in our lives, we're the unclean of the unclean. Nothing is going in our favor. We don't even know to look for anything different. And here Jesus comes, unbidden into our lives, displays his awesome power, not to oppress, to abuse, to destroy but to serve, to heal, and to make whole. And once he's made us whole, all he wants us to do, go home and tell everyone you're able to do what God has done for you. This is our vocation as the disciples of Jesus. And it's simpler than we make it out to be because we're not doing the heavy lifting because we don't have the power. Jesus has the power. In his name, amen.